Nelson's message this morning is entitled, A Critical Choice. He asked me to read from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. Matthew 7, 13 through 20. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Lord's blessings to you, Nelson. As Roland mentioned already, we're covering the last in this six-part series from the Sermon on the Mount. We will have covered 111 verses, which really doesn't seem like that many verses, but when you think about all the stuff we covered, it's pretty amazing. And I've referred to this different times as the most comprehensive teaching of Jesus. We will end this week with what I consider maybe the essential way to end, and that is with a choice. We looked at six sessions, three chapters of the Bible, calling us to a variety of different things, and here we come to the end when we need to make a choice. Now, many of us have made that choice already. It asks us to make a choice between life and death, between good and evil, and essentially between Jesus and and Satan. Came across this quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, one's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It is expressed in the choices one makes. In other words, actions. In the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die. And the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility. The interesting thing about Christianity is it's always just one generation long. Each generation, each person must make their own decision, their own choice. It's not something that anyone is born into. So far, we looked at the Beatitudes, which reveal the behavior that God blesses. And you could go back and review that, all the different things that God says, I will bless you if you do this. Then we took two weeks to examine the greater righteousness of Christ. And that was where you often heard, it was said, but I say. So he's sort of taking the Old Testament and reinterpreting it. In the fourth week, we covered the subjects of prayer and fasting and hypocrisy. We looked especially at the Lord's Prayer, as you might recall. That was a little bit of a different week, in which I used some videos. Last week, we took a look at a whole bunch of sayings of Jesus. And sometimes those sayings are what we refer to as the hard sayings of Jesus that are difficult to follow, but we're still called to make choices. And again, we wrap it up this week by presenting the choices that all believers must make daily. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your words in the scripture. They're challenging, but they can be comforting at the same time. We know that you walk with us through these choices. And so we ask, Lord, that you would empower us and strengthen us. Use this message this morning to remind us of your way. In your name we pray. Amen. The key text, it's a pretty long one, but it's not as long as some of the weeks. Matthew 7, 13 to 29 The overall view of this text is a critical choice. 
And you'll see this throughout the text. You'll see a variety of different ways Jesus presents choices to us. So we'll start with just a brief introduction from Mark 8, 36 from the Good News Bible. Jesus said these words, do people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. So he's saying if we are trying to gain the world or worldly things, possessions and power and status and all that, we lose our lives. And that's the choices that we make are whether or not we're going to have true life in Christ or not. So let's begin in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Very familiar verses to us, talking about the two ways, the narrow and the wide, or the broad and the narrow. Starting at verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. There's two gates in this metaphor. One is narrow and one is wide. So automatically, if you use your imagination, you can picture this. If a whole group of people are coming down the road, and there's two gates, and one's narrow and one's wide, most people are going to go to the wide gate. That's the point that Jesus is making. People go where it's the easiest. They tend to do what's the easiest thing. We're called to choose the narrow gate. Christians will often be in the minority because we choose the narrow gate. And he tells us why that's important. When we choose the broad road or the wide gate, we're choosing destruction. We're choosing the Satan, we're choosing the devil's way. And we're just going along with the crowd. And he adds to it by saying in verse 14, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few will find it. You see the choice? It comes down to what we choose. When we see that here's a road that goes to destruction, here's a road that goes to life, do we take the easy road even though we know where it goes or do we choose the more difficult road, because we know that it has life at the end of it. The next section is what I refer to as being known by their fruits. So we already had three times this morning that we talked about fruits in one way or another, starting at verse 15. <clears throat> Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. It's interesting that this whole concept of false prophets, it sort of comes and goes in our society. And just recently, we've heard a lot about false prophets, people who prophesied certain things and it didn't come to pass. And if you're not sure how to determine if someone's a false prophet or not, Deuteronomy 18.22 is very clear. It's explicit. If what a prophet says in the name of the Lord does not happen, it's not the Lord's message. That prophet was speaking his own ideas, so don't be afraid of him. <clears throat> the interesting thing, or the difficult thing is, when we first hear a prophet, we don't always know if they're false or not. We need to test them and check it out against the Scripture. But afterward, we know clearly by whether or not what they said came true. And then Jesus continues and he adds how we know. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? I love these metaphors because he's sort of saying, well, duh, you should get this. You should understand that the fruit that a person demonstrates will have a lot to do with whether what they say is accurate or not, whether or not they are true or false prophets. And he continues, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. It sounds like he's repeating himself, but... 
obviously, he's trying to make the point that sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we don't realize that what we're listening to or what we're following is wrong. It's not biblical. It's not Christ-centered. And so I go to Paul's writings in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit, so these are the measurements of false and true prophets, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I always love this line. Against such thing, there's no law. There's never a law that says, don't do these things. Don't live this way. That would be a bad thing to do. No, these are the things that we as Christians are called to live and to demonstrate in our daily lives. Back to Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 19. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Harsh words, but don't say you weren't warned. The bottom line is Jesus is being very clear. He's not beating around the bush. He's not saying that, well, you know what, maybe, maybe a few people are going to make it. He's saying a tree that does not bear good fruit in normal life is going to be cut down and in spiritual life is going to be cut down. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. John adds to this in 1 John 4, 1. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Choices. What we hear, what we read, who we follow, we have choices to make and to test what we hear and what we see. Then Jesus moves on in verses 21 to 23, where he talks about true and false disciples. Let's see what he describes them as. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. If you check history, and you go back to the first 300 years of Christianity, it was pretty much all persecution. And then along comes the Roman emperor, Constantine, and he declares, everyone's a Christian now. I'm going to just baptize you all, and you're all going to be Christians. Well, that's the equivalent to someone saying, Lord, Lord, but not really being a follower. Because being a follower is a choice. It's a decision that an individual makes. It's not something that somebody else tells you you are. It's something you decide to do and be. So many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Wow, that's kind of tough. This appears to be a very spiritual person who's demonstrating some spiritual gifts in prophecy and in casting out demons. But the assumption here is that fruit has not been demonstrated in this person's life. And so Jesus says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. The next very short section is another really good illustration that we're all familiar with, the wise and the foolish builders. Again, you'll notice choices are so important. Verse 24. <clears throat> Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Just let that sink in a little bit. It makes sense. A foundation. We're talking about a foundation. We're talking about something that doesn't move. You don't want a house that shifts and moves and pretty soon you have to leave it because it's going to be a wreck. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no one can lay any foundation other than one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's just reaffirming what Jesus is saying about building on the rock or in this case, building on him. 
So then it goes on. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And then he goes on. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. What are we building our lives on? Are we building our lives on rock or on sand? Is it steady or is it shifting? And then Jesus wraps this up by reminding these folks, the listeners, the people that are hearing him speak, and then to us as well, that he uses authority from his Father in heaven. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. We see this throughout the New Testament that people were amazed at Jesus' teachings. They understood that there was something different about the way he taught, different than the teachers, the rabbis, and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees that they were listening to. It was just a sense And we have Jesus' own words in Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them, meaning the disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Following Jesus is a choice. No one is born a Christian. At some point, each one of us has to say, Yes to Jesus. I want to follow you. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. William James once said, when you have to make a choice and don't make it, that is in itself a choice. In other words, when you hear the gospel, if you don't choose to follow Jesus, you've just made the choice. Really, the choice of hell. And James says, so then if you know the good you ought to do and don't do it, you sin. Again, that's reflecting the fruit of the Spirit. What is in your life? What is demonstrated in your life? We should be amazed at the authority of Jesus' words. Amazed enough to follow them and live by them. This Sermon on the Mount is a challenge for us to choose the way of Christ to choose his actions. It's a measuring stick for our behavior. I think I mentioned that in the first week. We need to keep in mind that this sermon is a call to righteousness. So the best life for us, the best life for anyone, happens when we follow the ways of Jesus. So I leave you with John 10, verses 9 and 10 from the Contemporary English Version. Jesus says again, I am the gate. So think back to the gates that he referred to earlier. All who come through me will be saved. Through me they will come and go and find pasture. A thief comes only to rob, kill, and destroy. And here's the essence of the whole Sermon on the Mount. I came so that everyone would have life and have it in its fullest. Let's pray. Lord, we know that some of these words of yours are hard sayings, but we also know that your Holy Spirit empowers us to live them. We invite you to move among us, to challenge us, to comfort us, to strengthen us as we move forward and make the choices that you've called us to make. Reveal the fruit of your Spirit in our lives so that folks around us can say they've been with Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Roland?